Something like that. Oh boy, I went too far tonight because I want one four zero. Yeah, I'm not gonna have time to breathe again. Good God. <laughs> Returning to IFR training after a year off is almost like starting over. We'll do a hold, we'll do an approach, and we'll assess it. It's yeah. a nice, simple exercise from which we can figure out just how rusty you got in all this time away. Okay. Ready right. to go? Nope. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, so look at my book here, my notes. Uh, my last lesson was 11 months ago, and I'm not really prepared today, so I just kind of, I want to get back into IFR, and I figured the best way to do it was to assess myself. This is not the way to do this. Do not show up at lessons unprepared. Well, the basic principles of IFR flying. Shiny side up is always the most important thing. Okay? You do not want to lose control of an airplane anytime. Certainly not while you're in the soup. Okay, so I'm gonna go a minute. I'm gonna stay on the protected side and I'm gonna hold everything stable here. The second aspect is situational awareness. Knowing where you are, how fast you're going towards or away from something. The time that you spend halfway through the turn inbound, you've got this monster tailwind pushing you towards the lobe. I it's, made it. It did go full scale, but it was it's close. Nothing like, yeah, but watch the correction now because you're almost 90 degrees to the... All right, so I went too much. Yeah. yeah. And now you're going to blow through the other way. This is part two of my return to IFR training. We're sort of jumping into the middle because I wanted to assess myself. So as I get back into full-scale training, we'll definitely cover all the basics that we're not addressing here in lots of other videos. And despite having great information, these videos are not for training purposes. I do my best to maintain the essence of the training, but obviously editing removes context. So for now, we're doing a hold, transitioning into an ILS approach. When we come inbound, we want to try and line up on the localizer. And this is one of the reasons we teach holds right away, is because it's a great way to find out whether you can intercept an inbound course for an approach. Right. Why not do it up at a safe altitude? This is what you call chasing. Yes. Let's not do that. But if I get to 140 and it gets centered, I'll still be okay, right? Yep. So we're doing it. I'm flying like a fighter pilot on instruments. But we did it. Another objective of today's flight was working the iPad into my pre-flight as well as in cockpit routine. Now it's no secret that I'm sponsored by ForeFlight. I've been using it for my VFR flying for years, but for IFR I'm just getting started as a student, so we're trying to figure out how to phase in these new modern tools. I would suggest that if you don't know the traditional way, then that'll make it even harder to do it the new way. Right. Because now you can't see how the one parallels the other. Yeah, for sure. Right? Yeah. You know, a pencil never runs out of batteries, and a map doesn't break when you drop it on the ground. But it does fly out the window when the... Well, it can fly out the window, <laughs> sure. But okay, so fair enough. So I want to try to find a way to obviously learn the old school way, but I, I want to learn how to use these tools into my workflow in such a way that it's not suddenly this weird transition. You haven't even got your instrument rating yet. The benefit of something like that uh, should be earned. Uh, you have to prove that you can do it the old way. You have to be able to flight plan as if you were stuck in some little shack up north with no internet and you just finished dropping your iPad on the, on the ice and smashed the screen out of it. So regardless of using tablets and iPads in your training environment, the fact is for the written test, you have to do it on paper and you have a very limited number of E6B type uh, calculators that you can use, at least for the Canadian flight test. I think it's the same for the American one. So just for the sake of fun, can I play with this while we talk about briefing? All right. But for today, let's do it for two reasons. One is the moving map, so you can show your position relative yeah. to something, and we're yeah. also going to use it for calling up approach plates. If I am using it for the plate, then the best place to have it is right up so that it's in your field of view, yeah. and it's easy to access, and it doesn't jiggle around, Right. and that's a yoke clip. This is a whole part of what I want to work I don't want in. my moving my head around too much when mm -hmm. I'm in instrument conditions. Right, and I that's... sure as heck don't want to drop the stupid thing on the floor. Yeah. And in turbulent conditions, a lot of times I find that the knee boards get in the way. Yeah. You'll, you'll jam it. In the, you did it once in the super cover, remember? Yeah. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's a good point, though. I mean, I'm going to be flying airplanes that are sticks or whatever, so I can't necessarily depend on a yoke mount. But this is, this is all part of why I want to do this with an instructor before I start trying to figure out my workflow. OK, so I'm going to have it on my lap today. We'll see how we do. Okay, so I'm uh, holding that stable. Yeah. I didn't set my timer, damn it. But I have distance. That's way to get to zero. Yep. Wow, okay, so here we go. That happens fast, eh? Yep. Good lord. And regarding topics that deserve their own videos, approach plate briefing is definitely something I want to expand on in the future. Okay, so when I get sta established on my outbound, um, I would like to brief the plate. Would you agree that that's a good decision? When do you think is a good time to brief? 
when we're not busy. When we're not busy is a good time. We don't have an autopilot in this airplane, so about the only time that we're really not busy is when we're going in a straight line. So inbound or outbound legs? Yeah, and since outbound is not as crucial as inbound, right. maybe outbound is a better time to, to brief. Yeah. But you only get a minute to do it. All right. Is it, do we have time to do one more orbit if I can't? Oh, yeah. All right, so let's do that. Yeah, so, good evening, Charlie Foxtrot, Hotel Golf. Charlie's with you on um, the uh, left visual for one, two. Uh, so we can't do it now anyways because somebody's doing an approach underneath us. Two, nine, or seven, eight. Number one, runway one, two, and I'm sure Toronto pointed out the traffic. I've got 172 holding on the Ancaster Beacon, level 3,000 feet. You'll be underneath. Wow, so am I, am I not doing enough correction here? I thought I was, but I'm not, eh? Pop a Victor talk. Papa Victor, go. Six Papa Victor, traffic at uh, two o'clock, five miles is a challenger. Level at 2,500 feet. They'll be descending inbound for runway one, two underneath you. Uh, not below 3,000 feet till advised. Okay, eyes open for traffic. We'll call him out when we see him, and then once he passes, we'll request the simulator ILS one, two as well. And Victor, Papa Victor, tower checks. Have I really, ground, has it really been 90 seconds since I, did I forget to do my timer? Uh, it's only, okay, so we're good, we got a mile. Hamilton number eight departure. Flight plan Rudin, depart runway one, two. I can't breathe for the guy getting clearance. Code five, four, seven, four. I'm looking for that challenge. Hey, one, nine, six, four, clear to Orlando. Hamilton eight departure on the flight plan. I want to go to our There he is over there, Steve James. Just under our right wing tip. Okay, yeah. The traffic. So yeah, I couldn't have briefed that with all that clearance going on, so unfortunately I missed my chance to brief it and I'm about to need to turn it bound to yeah. point two. Now just watch your altitude, not below 3,000. You got a challenge. You can go up if well, you I want, am but up. don't I'm, go below. I'm almost at 32. Yeah. You want to shoot that jet, James? I'm going to do my best. Coming up right here. Sam? Yeah, I got him. Hopefully he's in focus. Oh, that's awesome. Hotel Golf Charlie Tower, clear to land runway 12. And you went right through the Oh, line. I got him. I went right through the what now? Right through the localizer. Oh yeah, I didn't even see it. It's fully deflected already, eh? Oh yeah. All right, so we're back on board. I'm gonna try to chase this localizer, somehow brief plate, and I'm gonna fight to get back to it. Um, something like the, oh boy, I went too far, didn't I? Cause I want one, four, zero. Yeah, I'm not gonna have time to brief again. Good God. <laughs> okay, altitude is way too high. Heading, I guess I'm still gonna have to turn to 140 whenever this happens, which, eh. Distance 1.2 miles. Yeah, because I gotta lose some altitude. Victor, Papa, Victor Tower, simulated ILS runway 1 2 approach, approve, maintain VFR at all times, report Ancaster Beacon on final. Okay, we'll call you Ancaster final, Victor, Papa, Victor. Alright. Victor, Papa, Victor, your altitude restriction is cancelled. Caution, possible weight turbulence uh, if you drop down to 2.5 or below from the uh, Challenger. Victor, Papa, Victor, Roger, with the remarks. Okay, watch your turn to the proper outbound because we don't want to blow through the localizer this time. Oh, so here we go, right? Something like that. Holding that. Yeah, maybe even a bit yeah, more than left. another 10 degrees to the left. All right, so with an ILS, I mean, we obviously have the localizer tuned. It's working. On a flight test, you'd want to identify it. That's the correct frequency. And really, there's nothing else to worry about other than the well, beacon crossing altitude and the decision height. But I got to brief the plate. I got to know I'm looking at the right plate with the proper date. A lot of this has to be predicated on the what if right. thing. If you lose communication, you have to have the information that you need because you're in the soup. You can't see the ground. You don't know where the obstacles are. Everything in IFR is based on tracks. We fly headings because that's easy for us to see. That's what we're used to. But in reality, we're trying to maintain tracks over the ground. Mm -hmm. Another reason that electronics is nice because it reads out track. You need to descend to the procedure altitude, which is uh, 2700, and you gotta fly outbound until you get below the glide path now. Okay, so I'm going to stay on the outbound. I'm going to descend for 2700. I'll go off Charlie Tower exit right there. I'm still flying the outbound leg too tight, and Dennis is trying to help me compensate, but I'm task saturated. Because we need to be below glide path before, before you can turn back in. Okay, and for the procedure turn, this is going to be a racetrack? Yep. Okay, so I'm going to level off at 27? Yep. And then once the glide slopes kind of... There we are now, so yep. further is just more conservative. Yep. But I don't want to go below 27, correct? Not until you're established inbound. Right. So. Okay, so I'm, I'm happy with my track. If anything, it's conservatively uh, away. Altitude is good. So when I get onto the uh, procedure turn, it's going to happen 2700. I need to pass the beacon. I'm doing an ILS approach, correct? Yes. Correct. So I, I can go. Right, three. Nine, 19, 50. Right, three, oh, right, right. Turn. Okay. Let's start intercepting for. 
Three ground for C, yeah. Bravo 0635. Trying to finish my briefing before I did that, but okay. So, I can go over the beacon at 1950. Okay. I can start descending, which I've already done, which I shouldn't, until I'm on the localizer. Yeah, you have to be ideally within two dots of the center of the localizer before you start descending. Okay, so right now, what I'm looking for is the localizer to come alive. You think I need to turn steeper, right? Oh, geez, yeah. Oh, geez, okay. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, we got a 50 knot tailwind, right? Yeah. And cheating and looking at my my uh, iPad and everything else, I can see there's no hope in hell that I'm even close to 90. Squadron Red 3 is now off the field, being center main quarters, thanks. So I'm totally going to blow through it. The right. question is whether it'll be full deflection or not. So screwing up the intercept this badly, if it was actual IMC or a flight test, it'd be safer to call MIST and get vectored around for another try. So I just should have been further on the uh, protected side, eh? Almost full scale deflection. Right. Oh, is it there? Oh, let's park in the last dot and... Well, I guess would you call that full scale deflection? Yeah, I'll let it go this time, but... Yeah, close. All right, so again, don't turn to 90 degree intercept. So 45 something like... 45 is fine. Something like this. Yeah. I'm gonna hold this. That's too much. Is it? Yeah. Well, I see where one two is and the little 45 degree tick mark on the heading indicator. And look at the loke again. Look it's coming alive. So I'm gonna start turning to 140, which I knew worked. And then as I get lower, it'll need to be less because the wind will probably get less strong. Do we yeah. know what the surface widths are? I didn't make note of that. Eight is. And keep the turn going. Yeah, to get intercepted because I blow through it again. Yeah. <laughs> Hamilton Airport. Information November. Weather at 2200 Zulu, wind 130 at 6. There you go, 130 at 6 on the ground. Okay, now hold on to your altitude because you have to follow the yeah, glide so slope. I just blew it. I'm not there yet. Until these things are centered, I'm not I'm not established. So uh, you, could, you could follow the glide path down now legally because you're within a couple dots of the center line of the localizer, but, you know, we're striving for something better than that. All right, now pay attention because you're coming over the beacon. Your glide path crossing altitude. And I just went through the low. What the hell am I doing? I thought I had that. Well, so if I get full scale deflection above, I'm still not, it's not cool, right? It's not cool anywhere. No tower, uh, Victor Bob Victor, is that Custer fine? Victor Papa Victor Tower, Roger, what's your intentions next? On this, uh, we're going to start a uh, shallow left turn. We're just testing out some TAWS equipment as well. On the overshoot, we're going to head back to Burlington. Victor Papa Victor, Roger, all approved on your mist and wind check 1507. Cleared low approach overshoot runway 12. Victor Papa Victor. Watch your heading. You take uh, too big of a cut. Oh, I'm it. fixing it too much, right? You're coming in the skinny end of the funnel. You can't make big corrections like that. Yeah. Now I'm chasing. Okay, okay. stabilize. So what's decision height? I don't know. Plate. Uh, for the ILS, the center yeah. is 980. Correct. Look at that. Those okay, needles are centered like a pro. So start singing them out. 1480 for 980. So on the way down, it was challenging to deal with the crab angle changing constantly. And also, I just want to point out the Sony A7S is a ridiculous DSLR. That latitude is crazy. This is James's new camera. We're not sponsored by it, but it's awesome. Okay. Okay. So anyway, everything is stable. I'm not doing big corrections. And um, I am too fast, so let's get her configured. Uh, I'm at 1300 for 980. Okay. So I'm going to look up at what, 1100 or something? Well, no. In this time, in this case, you're going to look up at 980. Oh. It's okay. just that in in real life, you you're not going to wait till decision night to look up. You're oh right. Look we up just got the training. I'm flying to minimums. Right. Gotcha. Okay. Holding everything stable. 1180 for 980. Speed is slowing down to get stabilized. 1080 for 980. Okay. Glide path on localizer. A little bit below. below. Now, if I was cheating with my synthetic vision, I got a runway right in front of me. That's cool. Okay. Uh, yeah, but anyways. There you go. So coming up on 980. So I'm gonna get ready to look up. And look up. And there is in fact a runway in front of me with two reds and two whites. That's awesome. Nicely done. You okay. got that shot, James? Oh, I got it. Okay, right, so we're overshooting. So start the overshoot, and what I want you to do is maintain runway heading. The missed approach instruction was to climb to 2,000, but you're going to shallow it out a little bit. Uh, Typically, when you pitch up, you see you get the impression that you're accelerating, and when you accelerate, you, you could mistake acceleration for pitch up or pitch up for acceleration. So in this case, you maybe think that you are pitching up when in fact all you're doing is accelerating so you don't raise the nose anymore. Right. And typically most students, because the airplane was trimmed to go faster, they slowly relax the back pressure on the trim 
and they end up not climbing at all. Right. And now they're getting dangerously close to the obstacles that are around them. So you start a left-hand turn now. Hail Tower, uh, Victor, Problem Victor, in the Mest 090 heading. We're going to come within a respectable distance of the CH Tower, and then we're going to head off to the north, up to Burlington. Dennis saw an opportunity here to illustrate the usefulness of synthetic vision to help avoid obstacles in the event of failure to correctly execute a missed approach. In a real mist, it's maintain runway heading with a positive rate of climb. Yeah, there's that tower, okay. okay do you see it? On the, on the synthetic vision, I don't yeah. see it with my eyeballs, but... So now you see yourself heading towards it, what's the prudent thing to do? Get Besides up. turn away and climb? Climb. So yeah. let's climb up and it should turn yellow and then become no threat. There we go. And yeah, it's no longer a threat. Turn okay. yellow. All right. Okay, wings level. Wings and level. we'll vector you back in for an approach into Burlington. All right, so I'm actually reasonably happy with my instrument flying. The flying this part is fine. The, here it's the ability to kind of God's eye view the situational awareness, especially as, as it's affected by the wind. Tell me when you need something. I just got to take a break. The bumpiness gave me a little bit of grossness. Yeah, you take a break, over. dude. Start looking out the window and just enjoy the flight. From now on, you don't need to shoot anything further. Continue the left turn to a 210 heading. 210 descending for 15. This is going to be a good test of snapping out. Are you going to fly me down a minimums type thing? Yep. Yeah, so the, the challenge to this type of thing is suddenly landing. Yeah, it's almost like that, you know, that old saying when you've been on a boat for too long and you need to get your land legs back. Yes, it is. The same situation. If you spend too much time under the hood, you'd almost have to yeah. relearn how to fly visually. I'm going to turn the runway lights on for you. And they work. Thank goodness. A couple nights ago, one of the rental pilots was rapid firing the uh, Arkel and blew the box up and we couldn't get the lights on. I had to go over to the shack and turn them on manually. So it actually physically damaged the Arkel? Well, it did something to one of the relays. I don't know if it popped an internal breaker or something in it, but either way, it wouldn't work until the airport electrician went back and reset things. Another learning moment from this flight was that we didn't intend to come back after dark. It was supposed to be an earlier departure, but we got held up during pre-flight. And there's a big status board at dispatch, so beyond checking the journey log, which I'd done, I knew the landing light wasn't serviceable, but I didn't think I was going to need it. So of course by now I've forgotten about that, and I just flicked a switch to a landing light that didn't turn on. Okay. Continue the descent to 1,000, and 1,100 you can look up, maintain this heading. 1,100 okay. is the uh, IFR minimum for the approach to this airport, albeit it would be from the other end. Okay, so everything is happy, there's 1,100, I'm going to look up, and I see a runway. So now I'm going to land an airplane like I'm a VFR guy. Okay, that is so weird to transition. Going 20 flaps. Bob Victor's uh, short final runway 1-4. Do you feel up to shooting the landing, James, or you want to let it I'm go? I'm shooting it. Okay, yeah, don't get yourself sick, though. It's secondary. It's all right, I barf on Dennis's head. Great. I should have worn my hoodie. Okay, Steve. Something to barf into. This is weird, man. It is weird. I feel like land... Yeah, that land legs analogy... Ugh, I feel like I'm doing this as a third person, like I'm not quite here. A disembodied pilot? <laughs> yeah, like I know what I'm supposed to do, but I'm not feeling it quite yet. I'm also, I'm also not night current. My tendency is to flare late, so I'm going to keep that in mind. Yeah. When, I, when I'm not night current, I flare late and flat land it, so yeah. let's not do that. All right. Okay, yeah, nose up a bit. Yeah, see, that's what I'm talking about. When I'm not night current, I do that. Oh, uh, see, that was sooner than I thought, but not terrible. All right. Yeah, that's actually pretty good, considering that the frickin', obviously, the landing light wasn't doesn't working. work. Yeah, I didn't feel it. <laughs> oh, was it not on? No, it was the, I, the landing lights burned out. That was oh, that's taxi, taxi light. Yeah. So if we would have known that we were coming back at night, we would have done a full light check, right? Yes, we would have, but this was later than planned. Okay. All right, Going. I have the taxi. You got it, yeah. I'm mentally just... A little drained. So I've obviously got a ways to go for my instrument rating, but I'll be working on it and documenting it. Uh, but I do need to take some time to actually focus on being a student, not a filmmaker. So I'm going to take a break from IFR videos for a while, but I'll get back to it. Meantime, I've got a whole summer's worth of awesome tailwheel flying to edit. Anyways, thanks to Four Flight and Pilot Workshops, and definitely thanks to all the supporters on Patreon, and keep your flight chop sharp. So that was an hour long IFR lesson, and it felt like a five hour drive. The most visceral feeling is the reminder of the brain mush. I could not see anything but the instruments the whole time, and I'm, I, I'm just fried. It's amazing.